last week uh, when there were some questions raised regarding the legality of the public hearing notices and the public hearing themselves so that we would investigate and report back to the council tonight. I have conferred with the city attorney and the city clerk and we feel confident that we follow proper procedures and that the public hearing notices are legal and valid. Uh, for the following reasons, <coughs> the state law requires four four items to be included in the public hearing notices. One, um, describing the nature of the request. Two, indicate the property that the subject, that is the subject of the request. State when and where the request will be considered. And indicate when and where written comments will be received. We went back several months and verified that all the Planning Commission public hearing notices 
and the City Council notices comply with those four fundamental requirements. Now that's not to say that there was not some technical oversight with some subsections that were referenced in the introductory paragraph. The clerk's office, the city attorney and myself have reviewed that introductory paragraph and we're going to clean that up and streamline it in the future so that those errors aren't made. Secondly, with regards to the amount of time for the notification, um, back in 2006, Public Act 110 was amended and changed the uh, notification requirements from a minimum of five days, maximum of 15, to at least 15 days. And the uh, planning department has been complying with those state requirements since 2006. The ordinance itself, the subsection that talks about notices, has, was never updated and amended to reflect the new state law. So moving forward, the planning and legal departments will draft an amendment to the zoning ordinance for your consideration to update the specific section of the ordinance dealing with public notices. And we reviewed the four public hearings at the council, and in this case, uh, the, the public hearing notices comply with both the city and state requirements. So we feel pretty confident that the two that were acted on and the two that will be coming back on the 13th have been all correctly notified and are valid. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that the council might have at this time. Uh, Mr. Yeah, I just have a few questions. So as we approach our next um, regular council meeting, uh, what's I guess, Ms. Ward, what's the, the procedure moving forward? We just have to notice again for those. We had four public uh, hearings. So the first two go forward as we approve of them. Yes. And then we reopen the, the third one, um, but we would have to notice it well, correctly. Well, we, we postponed both of those public hearings. One was kind of in the middle of the public hearing, and one the second one we never even opened. But both of those public hearings were postponed to a date certain. Okay. And so now those will just be back in front of you on the 13th. We'll continue the public hearing on the 1st, and we will open the second one and go through a public hearing. Do we need to re-notice any No, because we okay. did. We postponed, postponed to a date certain. And then my second question is, is someone, can someone let Mr. Mullen know uh, this information? So that we, oh, he's here? Oh, perfect. Okay. There you go. That's all. My question is answered. Um, Mr. Scott, do you have any questions?
Through, through the chair, when when that item comes up, I'd be happy to restate we'll state we'll these items. Thank you very much. Budget preview, uh, the first of uh, a series of uh, opportunities for us to work together on the budget for 2012-13. Uh, normally, uh, each January, uh, we start uh, officially the, the budget process uh, with uh, the City Council. Uh, we've already began the technical work on the budget several weeks ago, uh, but uh, that's just to uh, get started uh, to get the uh, the uh, process uh, all set up, but this begins the the uh, policy discussions. Uh, focusing on the long-term sustainability of the city of Southfield as a vibrant municipal entity. First things first, no kicking the can down the road, no quick fixes. We will tackle our fiscal responsibilities head on. Challenges. Ma major word is uncertainty and the challenges loom large. Examples. Tax base valuation challenges. Our tax base to in totality has dropped 31 percent in the last three years and is projected to drop uh, next year, the year we're talking about, all 13, and uh, the year uh, beyond that, uh, hopefully then uh, some stability or growth uh, will begin. Uh, commercial appeals and office vacancies uh, remain a, a problem and uh, remain a challenge. Foreclosures, a realty track, uh, has provided a uh, information on the third quarter of 2011 and foreclosures were up 6% uh, in the state of Michigan. Personal property. Uh, there is a, a legislative uh, push uh, in many quarters uh, that puts personal property at uh, some risk, uh, some substantial risk possibly. Personal property of course is the uh, machinery and equipment that businesses use to produce income. Uh, that would involve for the city of Southfield $8.9 million uh, annually across all funds, $392.4 million of taxable value, and represents 14.6% of the total tax base. Proposal A and WPW. Uh, WPW, once reduced, always reduced. Uh, we have uh, uh, had substantial discussions on this and uh, we are hoping uh, in the future for relief, uh, but this is the state of the law at this point and has been for some time. Unemployment. If uh, you look at the green handout, 
the budget is uh, submitted to the mayor on or before April 1st. Uh, on April 14th, the assessor submits the state equalized valuation and taxable value figures to the county. On the 23rd, the county will issue their SEV and taxable figures and their review uh, findings. On May 7th, the mayor submits the budget to council. On May 21st, the council budget uh, study session takes place. Uh, any, uh, there, there can be obviously other uh, sessions uh, scheduled in here, and there will be, but these are the mandated schedules per either charter or per our um, schedule of meetings that was uh, recently adopted uh, by city council. On the 29th, the state issues final SEV and taxable value figures. Up to that point, everything we, everything that we're doing on the budget is based on projections and estimates. On the 29th, it becomes more scientific. So what happens when we get those numbers is we go back to work and rework all of the revenue figures to make sure they exactly match what the taxable value figures are for the year. So when we go into the budget fiscal year, we know precisely uh, what uh, we will realize uh, in uh, taxable values as far as what is approved by the state and what our collections uh, uh, will be. Uh, on the June 3rd, the budget hearing notice is published. On the 18th, uh, the special budget adoption meeting is held at 6.30 p.m. And on July 1st, the fiscal year uh, will begin. This concludes our initial preview update. There will be much more as the process progresses. Uh, Deputy City Administrator Fred Zorn uh, will follow with an overview of our efforts to fight the foreclosure crisis that we talked about earlier through federally funded neighborhood stabilization programs. Uh, more to follow. Thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. Uh, just kind of walk, walk council through 
Um, NSP program, unlike other HUD programs, goes and deals with incomes up to 120% of the area median income. Most HUD programs deal between our, our typical CDBG program deals uh, below 80% and often goes 50 and 30%. These are the uh, incomes. Uh, to tell you, these numbers change monthly. Staff is updating these as we get them from HUD. Uh, kind of walk you through one person 23,250, four person household income can go as high as 79,680. Uh, I think these are numbers council has seen before. NSP1 was $3.2 million. We allocated $810,400 to what is referred to as a 25% set aside. Uh, that is the low income group. In other words, folks <coughs> who are in this income column are eligible to get this bucket of money, the $810,000. Um, here's our uh, scorecard to date, activity one, uh, the 25% set aside. Six families with, uh, who are classified as low income have been assisted. One home rehabilitation is in progress. The Growth Corporation has acquired 16 speculative homes of which at least seven will be targeted towards low-income families. We don't always know who's going to end up with these, uh, the home and because it's driven by the income's family. You may have a home that staff might have uh, felt was an activity too, which I'll be discussing in a moment, which will and uh, is, is ended up being bought by a low-income family. So that accounting is always a fluid item for us. The uh, Growth Corporation ha is in active discussions with Habitat for Humanity out of Oakland County for the purpose of developing seven, uh, four of the seven speculative homes, and we've had dialogues with two other uh, Oakland County-based nonprofit groups, all of which will be bringing talent uh, resources and some financial uh, resources uh, to our program. <coughs> NSP Activity 2 was $1.6 million. This has been the most popular piece of our program. Within our original plan, we had anticipated uh, 20 housing units. Uh, to date, 13 families whose incomes are either low to moderate or moderate to middle income have been assisted. Assistance to five families is pending. And again, we have 16 speculative homes. We believe at least seven of those homes will go to low-income families, possibly nine or slightly fewer will, will go towards this group. The amendment that we're asking council to consider on February 13th, which is currently out for public comment and will be out to public comment on to Monday, February 6th, will allow us to use NSP3 funds to complete the renovation of NSP1 uh, homes located in the NSP3 target area, and I'll walk you through that in a moment. Um, the city was entitled to 10% of our uh, of the grant for administrative, uh, which was 324000 uh, Activity 4, we budgeted $87,304.44, and that was to acquire properties near uh, public properties to which we've acquired three properties and tore them down. Two of those property homes, are, uh, props, properties are subject to horse, are adjacent to Horsetail Woods. The other is adjacent to um, Scott Bryce Park. Uh, the Southfield Academic Campus? Y yes. It's one of them. Okay. <coughs> all the properties have demolished and cleared. They all abut public spaces. Spaces. They've been cleared for green space expansion. Activity 5, we allocated $356,911 for the purpose of providing down payment assistance and or closing costs. This uh, assistance can come in the form of a grant, deferred loan, or reduced interest rates. At closing, we record these loans um, as soft seconds depending upon the income. They may be waived upon staying in the home for a certain period of time. If you're moderate to middle income, 100% of that loan is paid at, must be paid back at whichever time you sell the home. If you're low to moderate income, 50% must be paid back uh, upon sale and upon staying in the house, Diana, 10 years? It's, it's 10 years. Um, 
30, activity five, 36 uh, families from all income levels have been assisted. We currently have another 40 families on our waiting list. Wanted to go through, here's what the grant amounts and I 810,000 activity one, um, 1.62 was the final number for activity two, activity three, and there's our 3.2457. Activities drawn down. To date, activity one is drawn down 281,118.75. To date, I should say, this is as of December 31st, 2011. Activity two, oops, we've uh, drawn down the full grant amount. Activity three, 216,000. $53.30. Um, activity 4, we've drawn down 43237 Activity 5, um, we've drawn down $101, uh, $212.44. Remaining funds to be drawn down, these are the balances of the funds that we work with. In a moment, I'm going to talk about our program income. Once we have program income, we cannot draw down our balance fund until we've uh, completed the, we, until we've expended our program income. So these are our balances to draw down. So we've got roughly another $937,000 coming from HUD from NSP1. And then uh, programming act, program income by activity. We've had 1.2 million come in, in in program income, and that money is dispersed and, and goes back into the program as well. Of which uh, we do take 10% for administration. So this number here, the admin number, which was the uh, 324, will increase by 10% or another. $120,000. So roughly to date, we've earned program administrative fees of $454,000. Um, these are the expenses by activity. So far for activity one, we've spent $246,000. Activity two, $2.6 million. Activity three, this is what we've spent. There's another piece, the other number. To date, we've added 250000 for staff and wages. This is what's been ran through NSP. Uh, that's the one of the final remaining pieces I need, uh, exactly what we charged uh, the program for, for staff salaries. So for purposes of what we presented earlier, we used a plug figure and added an, another uh, 250 to that. So. Activity five, uh, we spent two hundred fifty-seven thousand five thirty-two. Uh, I wanted to show this uh, slide because this is property maintenance, property taxes, utilities. These are expenses that we've incurred in the program um, to date. This is a map of all the NSP properties we've impacted, and you can see the dots are pretty much throughout the city. All right, NSP3. NSP1 was the entire city. NSP3 is this blue shaded area. Uh, HUD would not let the entire city be qualified this time. Of these uh, 18 properties here, three of these actually have pending purchase agreements on them. We're proposing to use our NSP3 funds to complete the renovation of different properties in this blue area. Our remaining NSP1 funds <coughs> will be used to complete the other homes outside of that target area. When we submitted the plan, staff would argue that our language was sufficient. Upon review of HUD, they came back and said, make it explicitly clear. So when you see the amendment, you'll see it's all italicized that we, we clearly state it's our intent to use NSP3 funds to complete the renovation of NSP1 homes. Activity, or NSP3, uh, the grant amount that we've been approved for is a million 
dollars eighty-four thousand two fifty-four. We have activity one, which is again our twenty-five percent set aside. So two hundred and seventy-one thousand must be used to provide housing for families whose income levels are below the fifty percent uh, threshold. Activity two. We actually put another 162,000. Activity three, and in the amendment, this money will be moved into here. This is what we originally submitted, 542,000. Activity four, and I know the numbers are slightly different. If I were to re redo this, activity three in the NSP one was our administrative fees. Our activity four administration is there's another 108425 coming in in admin fees. So to date, you've had 454000 come in from NSP, one, and you'll have another administrative fees of another 100008 And that's what's paying your staff and, and your wages to complete this program. Um, on February 13th, we're asking for council to conduct the public hearing. And um, upon conducting the public hearing, we're at, we'll be asking council to approve the CDBG NSP uh, plan uh, uh, amendment. Erica, have we received any comment today on the plan? Not today. We received just one today from the Opportunity Fund that came a little after five. It was very complimentary. Uh, Rita Hillman, who's on the Southfield Housing Commission and with the Opportunity <coughs> Fund, has reviewed the amendments and is in favor of what we're uh, doing. And actually that organization has offered to partner with us on some mortgages. Um, Madam President, if I could just ask my staff, uh, is there anything you folks want to comment on? Or Diana, you've got a flow chart. Um, we can pass that out. I can go in depth through a, a process, or we're happy to do that one-on-one -on -one if council so wishes. Um, this program is very much a fluid program. It is uh, constantly uh, changing. These are flow charts that were developed as part of the submittal of our management plan to HUD. Um, These are some of just photos of our NSP homes. Uh, mm -hmm. Give you a, a little bit flavor of some of the properties we've worked on. Some we've acquired, some we've just provided down payment assistance to. Some are still uh, works in progress. Madam President, happy uh, to answer any questions.
it's not something I, I want, but I'd, I'd like to see the list. Certainly. Um, my next question is, are there any uh, defaults uh, um, for the people that are, are that have been selected to participate? Is, is everybody living up to... We, uh, we have uh, a number in uh, September of 2010, we did a number of land contracts. And at that time, markets uh, were changing very dramatically and the ability for people to put financing. So we put in place land contracts, but yes, we have had uh, defaults in land contracts and that'll be n uh, noted in those. And we have removed a, a family from an NSP home. And what happens when they default? Well, uh, in the case of the land contract, we take possessionary, uh, take the home back. Okay. Uh, we've not had any defaults on the mortgage end. Uh, in the in the case I'm, I'm <coughs> that comes to my mind immediately is that they weren't able to get a mortgage, uh, they weren't able to uh, fulfill the terms of the land contract, so they have been defaulted. All right, but is there? Um, then there's got to be some finan negative financial impact to the NFP program when this happens. Well, I would say in the case of the one property where we did have to default, the home has been broken into another time. So yes, there is a negative impact. It's one more uh, one more property that we thought we had committed, had under contract, and we weren't able to consummate uh, a mortgage. Uh, but the the thing to do for the program though is take the the property back and get it back in, in the market. That home upon uh, the departure of the family was turnkey ready. What's happened now is, is, is a major setback. Well, and I'm not, I'm not be, my intent is not to be critical. It's, um, uh, I, I certainly don't take your comments as critical. No. This is a complex I, I mean, I would think you'd ex I just want to know no. the degree of uh, long term success. No. It's really where I'm going. Um, I would suspect that um, anybody who does a program like this would probably, uh, you know, life happens to people, oh. and uh, somebody may not. We well, had a so client pass away after we made an offer on his behalf. Life happens. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. plan, we actually uh, looked at either the Housing Commission or the establishment of a nonprofit to administer the program. It was meant to take have a uh, housing component of it out of the council's hand. And I'll cite the uh, Housing Facilities Act, Public Act 18, 1933, which allowed housing commissions to be uh, created, oh, as well as uh, housing commissions to create nonprofits. And it was meant to buffer the housing decision and the mortgage and the, the, the awkward decisions that have to be made. It would be very difficult for this public body to have to go through an eviction, to have to go through a number of these processes. That's why our model was that uh, we would have a nonprofit, and it's a wholly controlled nonprofit with the board of directors being, com being comprised of staff uh, of individuals by virtue of the office or the management position they hold with the city. Now, how do you determine which homes will be purchased? What's the criteria? I initially, initially the homes that were bought were bought with a, a <coughs> where the end user, the end buyer, selected the home. They came in with a mortgage-ready uh, letter, and, and I'll, I'll be blunt with counsel. We have learned that those letters aren't always worth what they're written on. And I mean, you could read all the qualifiers and have a deal go south on you two days before or the morning before you think you got a closing. We've had that happen. So people come through, uh, they go through a general orientation. They come in with a, a mortgage commitment. They have to attend an eight-hour HUD uh, class by a, a certified HUD counseling entity. Um, staff meets with them. At this point, uh, Diana Pegler would meet with them. She would enter into a uh, commitment letter with them that we'd be willing to pursue making an offer on their behalf or procuring a home on their behalf. 
But we also do what's called the P calculation, uh, principal, interest, taxes, and, and interest. And within those calculations, we look at their annual income for the last two years, and it's 30%. We try to keep everyone within that 30% of their monthly income on that home. And, that, and that's com uh, those can, can be complex. Things change with income. Although that has not been the reason why we've had deals go south, per se. The other item that's unique with the program, that the first homes, we had the end buyers. And that was candidly the strength of our program. Other programs across the state, we are by far exceeding most communities. We're further ahead than most communities in, in placing families in homes. What made our program work was that the end buyer was selecting the home. Speculative <coughs> homes was not a position we wanted to be in. The issue we had, though, was we had to have our funds obligated by sep Erica, September 30th, 29 or 10? Um, 2010. 2010. So in having those funds obligated, we went out and we made some speculative purchases. Our activity one, that low income set aside, we bought some very modest homes, uh, primarily in the uh, 12 mile Greenfield, Catalpa, uh, to Southfield area, uh, that we thought would be ideally suitable for uh, a low income family, and get the principles of home ownership and such. Um, so I think our program was, was working great until HUD came in and, and said, listen, we're concerned about your ability to obligate. And if you look at a period of about two months, then we went out and bought a number of spec <coughs> homes. Um, I would rather not be in spec homes. You have to carry costs, utility costs. you got to keep snow removed. There are a lot of issues that go with that. Um, now, you said that anybody comes to the Southfield Growth Corporation, how are they made aware Oh, uh, internet, a lot of the realtors know. We've done outreach to bankers, to realtors. Uh, we've had multiple sessions um, with that. Now our strategy is going to change a little bit because we're going to be more focused on completing the renovation of these speculative homes and then getting them into the market. So it won't be uh, a realtor showing homes and saying, hey, maybe you should talk to the NSP folks will be marketing these homes to our realtors and such and asking them to help find families who are income eligible. My main concern again, and I uh, voiced it a couple weeks ago, is that the individuals that are placed in these homes, the homeowners, that we give them some sort of um, framework and guidelines on what our standards sure. are for the neighborhoods and that they know coming in what our, our requirements <laughs> are. have you been able to handle and, and kind of go through the process at one time? How many of your staff been able to, you know, just kind of at one time? Is it, it's not one and then one and then one and then one. No, at one point, uh, <laughs> there, there were probably uh, probably 15. Okay. There was a period where it was it was out of control. Okay. I mean, uh, giving our existing staffing and, uh, you know, HUD, HUD has said hire more people and, and we've said, listen, we're, we're this city's at financially. We can't do that. Uh, but that's part of also the reason why we are looking for, we've got a sub-recipient agreement that's been approved by HUD. Uh, I mentioned that agreement to council in October of 2011. Um, well, that's also why we're looking at a number of non-profit non right. partners, especially as we try to get, we're in a different arena. I know City of Westland, I spoke to their program director on Friday. She's still got eight homes sitting in an item mode with no potential buyers. So what, what, what's the timeline that you're looking under? When does this program sunset? When does um, it come to? One, one critical deadline is uh, March of 2013. And Diana, what's the NSP3? Uh, March 2014. 20, March 2014. Uh, we also, though, uh, this is a component of the CDBG program. And it can continue if the city elected they could continue to fund the program as a CDBG eligible uh, program. 
card. So you're you're fully able, like you're taking the NSP three funds for the NSP one program and just trying to draw down until it's until March of next March year. Of and, next you're year. and you're able with the homes that we have left in the program. I mean, you you said about fifteen at one time. You're able to take the remaining and just kind of run the same yeah. program you've been running. And to the council, we have a bail position within our NSP plan. There is the notion that if we can't sell a home, we'll do a lease to own or rent to own. It could be a rental managed by Oakland County Human um, Livingston's agency. There's the Oakland House, what is it, Erica Oakland uh, out of Troy, Kristen's group, the Oakland County uh, Community Housing Network. Yeah. They, they have said that that's something they would be, but we're not, our, our, stat, our position is to optimize the funds and I, six months from now, I'll, I may start looking at a male position. You know, maybe <laughs> go to Oakland, uh, Livingston, and say, would you cut rent this out okay. uh, for us? Okay. So, all right, that's all I have. Yes. Um, how is the funding for the staff handled? Is the city just reimbursed because they are city staff? The the, the answer is yes. The uh, <coughs> stat, uh, we, when we do draws, that'll be part of the final accounting. Uh, staff time charged <coughs> to the NSP one program is Diana and Scott's salary. So the city will be made whole on, on that. Okay. And, and the other thing is, is there um, a HUD requirement on the amount of time that a house can stay in the program? There is uh, the affordability requirements, and that's why we have a second lien on every property. And with those affordability requirements, depending upon what our participation, minimum of 10 years, then with NSP3, everything's going to a minimum of 15 years. So there is no timeline once you engage a house at the NSP <laughs> that there should be timelines for it to be processed. No, I obviously, we, I'd, I'd like to not be in the position of Westland holding homes, and we are holding homes. I, that's what the beauty of our, our first program is when we had those buyers. Those ones moved. I mean, we had someone in the office every day yeah. pushing and, pro and and that was good. <coughs> but uh, we, we need, um, I, I'd rather not be holding those. And, um, I, I'm not aware of any club <coughs> that says we've got to move it in you know, a hey, year. So one, uh, how are we going to do the homes we have now? Because I know at one time we put a bid out for a contract to come in. So how, how are we going to block the house? I mean, how are we going to... My, my next step, uh, plan amendment in front of the council <coughs> to the growth corporation is we've got an accounting exercise that we're wrapping up with them. And in the last few weeks, a lot of all the December 31 numbers have come in. We'll be going through that, and then we will... Uh, Scott, have we signed those contracts, or uh, we're looking at K-Long and Clarkson? Correct. So have those contracts been signed? Uh, the contracts have been signed and come back to us to be signed. So now it's the notice to proceed from the board, right. and that'll probably, um, I, um, I, need, I, I need to take that to the board, have that dialogue with them, that that'll be the growth corporation's decision. My recommendation would be that they proceed. Uh, Fred, uh, whatever the self <coughs> South of Growth Corporation does uh, is, is very limited uh, with the money that you get and the, and the amount of housing that you uh, fill. What do we do with the larger mass? In other words, these homes are uh, sitting vacant. I don't know what the figure is anymore, but you're going to get, you know, we had that, the ones that were given to us tonight, and there's more coming in due to tax sale. And, and you know, when I see the map with three little dots on it, you know, it, it, it is such a mammoth problem. We've impacted less than one percent of the problem. Yeah, but, but yeah, that's that's what my my problem is. Mm -hmm. and we're dealing with that one percent. How do we get a handle on the balance so they don't become 
the problem in the neighborhoods, the communities that we are, <coughs> that they're in, and and, uh, and and I guess protect the, 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 the values. Uh, you know, I just had a home in our subdivision go a quad level for $59,000 and sold six years ago for 250000 You know, and the thing, but I followed that one because it interests me on, on what's happening is Citibank had it, and, and, and I happen to know where Citibank had, had it because I thought somebody was taking the copper out of the house went over and checked it out with a truck and he said, oh, he's just making sure that it's secured and the water's off the net. Now it comes where in two days, I see a weekend, I see people going through the house and, and it's investors. And there been no notification that this was even for sale. And all of a sudden, on Monday, it's three days at noon, they closed the bidding on the house. And the house is still vacant. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take to fulfill the mortgage commitment or get a mortgage, but, you know, all these things are happening. You're packaging them, the real estate people are going on. I don't know <laughs> if, if we have a handle on the rentals of them, because that's the new business that everybody's getting into. And then, then I... Uh, picked up the Lumber report and, and now the federal government is uh, instead of what we are saying lease to own, it's the opposite. Own to lease. Mm -hmm. And the federal programs are going to start giving money uh, uh, in that direction. And and uh, so the, the investor is already going into that practice. <coughs> but I'm just trying to figure out how do we get a handle on all this in this community, because mm -hmm. I think it's getting worse. Uh, because every time I, and, and not only that, but some of the houses that that we, I don't even know who owns them. I think we own this one. Uh, it's neglected, and it's on Virginia. And every time I look at it, the garage door is even not even closed all the way. It's slanted, you know. And this, and the guy across the street, one home beautiful, you know. And he's got to look at that house across the street. And I know that, you know, we're talking tonight about your program and what you're doing with your program. But I think that that we've really got to come up with some kind of a citywide plan on what's happening with these investors, if we got a handle on these investors, if they are renting them out and bleeding them. Um, and what was surprising also to me was the guy buys a house for fifty nine thousand dollars and I don't know and I don't know what he's gonna sell it for, but but the neighborhood the value on homes was like a hundred and four thousand. The guy can't come out. So what's he gonna do with the house? The taxes on the house were four thousand dollars a year. So even as an investor you're gonna pay four thousand dollars a year, you're gonna have to put money up to it the standard so they can be sold or rented. If it's rented, I'd like to get a handle on who's renting it and get it registered. But I'm, I'm saying all these things because buying a home today, you know, uh, and rehabbing it, is, is exceeds the value. And and so why put money into a house that we put on the market? Why don't we use the money? In some other manner, which would would uh, somehow get these <coughs> people who are buying up by block to buy these houses and let them manage it, and then ride herd on them because there'll be rentals and rentals we can control, housing rentals. Uh, I mean, we have to come up with some kind of of a new deal here. We just have to work this thing because. And we're probably about 1,600 vacant homes, or more. It, it, in, since 2008, it's just under 5,000 homes. Council should not diminish what you've done in the adoption of the Certificate of Compliance Ordinance. At any home that's vacant, or any home that's vacant or closed, has to get a CFO. 
that will be a long window. Even when the foreclosure crisis is done, we will probably still be finding uh, properties that were, we know were vacant or closed and never got a CFO, we will have the legal right to get that CFO. Yeah, but who's, who's monitoring that? The, bu the building department mm -hmm. is, and, and, and I can tell you by the complaints. By the amount of dots that you have on a map, there's no way on earth. I mean, I know a house next door to me, the guy rented it for two years, the kids went to Southfield Lathrop, and nobody even knew, I was, he was never registered. Yeah. We, we still have the right to catch those, that ordinance is No, working. I understand that. It's working. I'm not arguing with you. The I just know that. We get that. <laughs> I just um, know that people are not turning them in. People are in the same business as the ones, so they're not going to turn it in. There's realtors who are out there buying homes in groups for guys who have capital. And, and I mean, if and we'll be able to come back at them at any time, the way that ordinance is written. I understand that. Fred. Um, and I'm last, I'm not doubting you. Last Thursday, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I'm saying is, you know, you, you catch them if you can. Right. And people are not turning them in. And we'll be catching them a long if time after that because those homes all have to have a certificate of compliance. Um, last Thursday's neighborhood service uh, committee meeting, this item came up, and. Were the people are being prosecuted. There were people being charged a thousand dollars for not for, for failing to get that, and the judges are supporting that. So, and, and I think it's important. Yes, there's more that we can do, but that philosophically was a huge shift for this city. This was a city that was hands off, very market market driven. We don't go in and do inspections. And your response to the foreclosure crisis was to put that in. That's very unique. I mean. A lot of cities are still hands off, don't want to touch it. You at least put something in place. We, we had a plan in 1995 on the housing issue here in South Hill. And here we are, 2012, and we still haven't had have a comprehensive plan on how we're going to deal with all these proposals. In 95? Aren't you glad I'm picking up all this garbage? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 my storage place. I will say Jim this. Jim laughs at me, but anyway. I, I think we know we need, and, and the building department continues to work on the rental for the <coughs> since it around so long. I, I firmly believe we need a land banking tool. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm of the opinion that the Southfield nonprofit, the owner of the McDowell, is sitting on $1.6 million if you count. We, we, they should be coming to the table in light of this foreclosure crisis, and there should be targeted neighborhoods that they look to make acquisition and demolition in. And frankly, they've been working a strategy like that to the neighborhood to the north for the last 10, 15 years. But maybe there's a few other neighborhoods that when a property becomes available, we buy it and just clear it out. I like using those funds because they don't have the encumbrances of those HUD funds. You use HUD dollars for acquisition and demolition, then you've got these liens being recorded on every piece of property that would need to be dealt with in the future. Okay, uh, I don't want to take on, take off from where uh, Mr. Professor left off on, on the uh, parental. If we happen to become aware of a parental see a sign up front or for guys around see a sign up front. Who do we refer this to? Just so they can verify well, whether uh, uh Lorna uh, uh, what's Lorna's last name in the building? Bowler. And thank you. Building department. The, her, Connie Mays, uh Carrie Cummingford. When I'm aware of them I call I usually just call Carrie on. Okay. All right. Uh, that's one. The, uh, the question that I had originally had was, uh, if I recall right, the, uh, when NSB1 came out, we had a five-year window to use those funds. If we didn't use all the funds, we had to turn them back at the end of the five years. Um, that was four. Pardon? Eric has given me the four-year. <laughs> oh, uh, four years? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There, it, and actually, there were conflicts in some of HUD's documents that did say five years. Okay. Um, 
In your presentation, you said we've had over a million dollars of program income. 1.2. Okay. Does that constitute the money that we have to return to the federal government? If no, it, it'll we don't return it, that. It'll back play it. forward, but as a if someone sells their home and the mortgage is paid back, it would go back to HUD. Uh, so if if I receive direct home ownership assistance of ten thousand dollars, and I was a moderate to middle income upon sale of my home. Uh, five years from now, that money would have to come back to the city of Southfield and then be returned to HUD. Okay, but the program income, if we don't reinvest it in new homes... It would go back to HUD. That would, that's yes, what I'm That yep. does go back. Yes, sir. Okay, so it behooves us to continue to find homes that we can either purchase or, or re and resell during this... Because is it 2013, the... Uh, when the window, window closes on that's correct uh, NSP okay. one yes okay in 2014 on NSP three yes okay. now the other question is uh, you say that the NSP program is uh, part of the CDBG but they're not commingled dollars or, or they are or not um, we're accounting for those dollars separately. Um, Eric, do you want to, can you answer that? Uh, they do share a, a bank account, but we keep track of NSP separately. So at the at the present, um, there there is funding that uh, CDBG owes NSP money simply because NSP spends um, at a more regular basis, and we're able to spend that money. Um, CDBG, I only do draws three or four times a year, so. It all goes in that one pot, but we keep track of them. So. Um, have we? Do we have the final figure for the uh, CDBG for 2012, 2013, or 2000? Yeah, 2012. We do have that final figure. I don't have it. It's like 407. I I, I don't want to. I know it went down from from this year. It's right around. 407 or 408 entitlement. I know that uh, at the federal level they were reducing the CDBG funding by 12%. Yes. Did that hit us <coughs> on a 12% basis? Yes, it did. So every, everything went down 12%. So the uh, the money that we're going to have to allocate to the things that we allocate is a lot less uh, this year than, than before. Now, the $810,000 that uh, was set aside for the low income uh, families. Does that $810,000, is part of that $810,000 used to purchase the property and re refurbish the property? Yes, sir. So there's significantly less money to to provide to the low or the low income folks as down payment or, so that all? No, actually the 50% uh, group under our direct home ownership assistance is 30% Diane, help me out. 30% uh, of the purchase price not to exceed 20000 Right, for low income. For low income. Mm -hmm. So our direct home ownership assistance is normally 10000 per uh, for lo uh, for low to moderate or moderate to middle income. But if you're below that 50% group, it goes to 30% 30, 30 of the purchase price not to exceed um, 20000 so we, that was kind of how what we did to help low-income families more. Okay, uh, are we uh, pretty low exhausting that eight hundred ten thousand dollars? Or no, actually, that's the, the I, I think that's that's our toughest bucket of money to spend out of. So we're we're uh, providing homes more for middle income. Absolutely. Yep. Rather than than the lower income. Yeah, I. Probably evenly split between the low to moderate to the moderate to middle, but that low income group is the toughest. That's why we're turning to Habitat and uh, uh, looking to talk to Oakland uh, Housing uh, and Community Network and some of these other groups because that's the toughest group to make homeowners. Okay, are th if, is there any uh, things in the NSP program that calls for affordable housing? As as we understand affordable housing, which is a, the, the strata of of incomes, the the answer is yes, there is. And, um, 
based on, on, on income, we're providing housing to folks who are low, to low to moderate, and then that moderate to middle. Yeah, but if we're not finding people to put in those homes, are we... What I don't want to have is, at the end of the program, somebody that's uh, an auditor at the other end saying, oh, you should have sold more homes to the to the low to moderate. Well, that's the, the, the requirement is minimum 25% of our grant and our program income must go into that uh, to, to assist families who are 50% below the area of medium income. Okay, so if we're having a hard time finding those folks, uh, should we kind of ratchet up our... Uh, That's what Habitat for Humanity is about, the uh, housing community network uh, out, out, of, out of Troy. That's what, that's what those dialogues are about, finding families. Uh, this group, Life Remodeled, who was presented to Neighborhood Services last Thursday, we're having <coughs> a conversation with them as well. Okay. All right. In fact, one of the homes, one of our speculative homes, is on that same block. Oh, is it? Okay. All right. That's, that's it. Um, uh, I appreciate you going to Troy and having sex for humanity. But could you consider maybe notifying the nonprofits that are in the city and letting them... Uh, a absolutely, Habitat. Aware of what, what a absolutely, doing. Habitat will be approaching a number of our faith-based organizations for partnership, as well as this group, Life Remodeled. But if there's a, a church, uh, a faith-based organization, or another nonprofit, we're happy to get a dialogue going. Okay. Thank you, Council.
um, is uh, very creditable to me, and I'd like to make that presentation. I'd like to say openly, though, I do respect and I, ask, I very much like our city administrator, Mr. Charette, and I want to say to him here, eyeball to eyeball, <coughs> that I do respect you, and we've had offline conversations. So it's very important to me that I not have the appearance of trying to shame any individual or leader except for the police chief that I'm alleging these allegations against. I'm sorry that I have to be aggressive with this. Uh, change agents do have to take chances, and change agents do have to stand out on a limb, and I'm willing to do that. I, I do hope that I'm making all these presentations pertaining to this chief in a respectful manner, but it is not going to go away. I'm hoping to have a closed door form to make the presentation, or else I feel that the only other opportunity for me is to, over the next three council meetings, maybe four, list all nine issues that I have direct evidence for and just present it and tell the story within my five minutes at the podium. I would prefer not to do that because, again, it makes it appear that I might be an adversarial person, uh, that I'm adversarial against my city, city uh, management, and I'm not. I am an active citizen. I'm a caring citizen. I'm a taxpayer whose taxes are up to date, whether late or not, they're up to date. I have made the financial commitment in terms of uh, capturing this information. I think that I've done my due diligence in, in the respectful manner that a citizen can, and I'm just asking for due process here. I'm asking not to be pushed back. I'm asking to just be treated fairly, although this is an uncomfortable topic. We cannot have any appearance of impropriety in our police department. I wanted to quit this, um, this whole project you know, just as recently as last Thursday, and there was a lot of hullabaloo from the police officers because, again, I'm a person, I'm an individual, I'm not related to these individuals, and everyone has a whiff on what's in it for me. All things that we do have to have a, be a mutual or have a mutual benefit. And because I'm fearful that the city administrators will, and the council members will look down on me for doing this, that I won't have fair access to city services. I won't have access to the ear of the council members because I brought this particular controversial issue up. So I'm hoping that after the FOIA comes back that I'll be granted that meeting, and I ask that through our president. Thank you, Mr. Do I, is there a way that I can com communicate to get the answer? Because I'm at, and sometimes you do answer citizens that come up here with a question, and I'm ha asking a question, and I know you guys are just intentionally not answering, but I do need that answer about a meeting, you know, with this topic, of, you know, closed door meeting as a citizen. I'm requesting it as a city service. We'll discuss that with our city attorney. Let me know. All right. Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to ask the indulgence of the council to recognize someone from the audience to, uh, to speak on behalf of the subject that's been before us once before. Well, we have several other items still on the agenda. I understand, I understand that. Also. But this is the, the communication section. Oh, all right. What, do you, what did you want to? Uh, I have representatives from the Golden Corral here, and since the last time we met, um, the Golden Corral, they have convinced me that they have done some adjustments <coughs> and uh, I'm not asking for a, a rescission of our decision. I'm only asking for an opportunity for them to come and talk to us about what they've done from before to now to give us some, some uh, basis for discussion uh, at a future time. You want them to speak tonight? Yeah, just for a, a short period of time. Well, and, the re and the reason for that is they have um, they have uh, invested a, a fair amount of money in options on a piece of property, and they need to know they have to they have to get kind of a feel for how we're going to respond to the next time they come, uh, because if if they get the feeling that we're not interested in in uh, uh, hearing their whole story, uh, they have an alternate. Uh, they have an, uh, an alternate plan that I under I understand they have an alternate plan, and uh, what will end up is we'll still have the traffic problem, but we won't have any revenue because the alternate location is 
very near this location, but in Labor Village. So what I'd like to what I'd like to do, what I'm asking tonight, is just to have them come and talk about what they've done. In the meantime, to give us a feel for is it something that we'd like to hear more of, and maybe rescind the decision that we made so that we can hear their whole plan. Well, that would be. They can't speak under the communication portion. If you want, I ask Why not? Because I'm not going to recognize them to speak. If the council, it will take four people, four of the majority of council, to recognize them to speak. I am not going to put them on the agenda. If four members of this council want to hear them, they will have to so advise. I would uh, support hearing uh, from. I would too. Anyone else? I will. I will. I will stay. But I want to limit to the five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. Well, so I, so I'm asking, I'm not asking for any decision tonight. I just want them to have an opportunity to know where do they go from here, because you heard the, you heard the presentation that Mr. Charette made about the revenue, and if we turn our back, and I'm not saying that we make the decision tonight. But if we turn our back on legitimate people that want to come in and provide revenue based on some strange individual decision, I think we're we're not really thinking our way through through a, a a situation, a critical situation. And I'm representing I am not representing Golden Corral, I am representing the citizens that voted for me to come into office to do the best thing that I know how to do for the city of Southfield. And if additional revenue is uh, possible, I want to at least hear about it so I can get as many uh, facts as I possibly can to make a make a informed decision when the time comes time to make the decision. And I, I just think we're well, I had another word, but I'm not going <laughs> to use that word. We have, I think it's dumb if we don't at least entertain the time to hear what they've been trying to do. All right, four members have agreed to have them speak on the communication. They have five minutes. And if you ever come to approach the podium, I need your name and address, business address for the record, and, and your five minutes start from the time that you speak. Thank you very much. I will not take the five minutes. I will just be very brief. And I thank you very much for your consideration and the council's consideration. My name is Rick Ratner. I'm an attorney in Birmingham, Michigan, for uh, 380 North Old Woodward, Birmingham, uh, 48009. I'm here on behalf of Golden Corral for a very simple reason. Uh, this uh, council turned down a potential rezoning so that we could install a Golden Corral on, on Southfield Road. Uh, there was much discussion about it and there was much uh, comment from the surrounding neighbors. We have listened to the neighbors and since that time we have gone to work very hard on a site plan which we think answers every single question of the neighbors. Not only that, we've taken the site plan and done some, uh, made some changes to it so that it is extremely safe and a major improvement to the traffic at that particular corner. Uh, we are hopefully, if you will allow us to, planning a meeting with the neighbors after this meeting if we can in some way know that we can get back on the agenda. I, I talked to council for the city and one way to do that, of course, is a, is a chance for uh, this, this council to rescind, vote to rescind the decision and give us another chance to come in front of you. With that chance, we hope to be able to give you all just a chance, all of our information, all of our changes, all of our answers to the neighbors, so that we can install a multi-million dollar restaurant at, on Southfield Road and do business here. We're very anxious to be in the city of Southfield. It's a fabulous place for this restaurant, and it's a great citizen for this community. We think it will be a benefit to the health, safety, and welfare of the community, and we would hope that you would give us a chance, just a chance, to show you again a modified version, if you will, of that restaurant and the work that we have done. To do that, I would ask council for the city to uh, clarify the, 
the way that that might happen even tonight. And it's not to approve it tonight, but it's to give us a chance at some future date, maybe the next meeting uh, of the council, so that we can present the full site plan with the whole presentation and you're able to get all of the information that may be necessary. That is our simple question, our, our, our plea to you to allow us a chance. I'm here for questions. Thank you. That's all I have to say. And by the way, with me is the owner of the restaurant, Mr. Kira Patel, and Mr. Oogerman is here. And we are uh, here to answer any questions if you have questions. Uh, I would like to uh, have our attorney explain uh, what the process would be if we agreed to bring it back to the full council. I'm only saying the that I would like the attorney to, to explain the, the process. We, we know the process. He doesn't know, I know the process. I just, I'm, 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 I'm genuinely serious. I, I'm curious. That was a good question that uh, I would have had myself. You don't know the process? I just want you clarification from meeting? the city attorney. You watched the meeting. Who are you kidding? But the, the, the question is the rescission process. That wasn't right. discussed at that meeting. Let the attorney speak. Go ahead, Mr. So uh, a vote was taken that evening. Uh, the motion was to approve. Um, and as I went through the minutes, uh, it was a six to one vote and to not approve. So it, th that motion did not pass. To get it back on the table, so that council could then do another public hearing, do whatever it wanted, just to put it back on the table so that if the issue is alive again, uh, could be undertaken by a motion to rescind. And a motion to rescind would then rescind the vote that basically failed to approve. It's kind of an odd situation that occurred there. But if that vote was rescinded, we would be back in a position where council had not taken any action on it. So it would be before council, um, again, a public hearing could be redone, um, and um, whatever the petitioner wanted to talk about or anything could be done within that parameters. That your council rules of procedure do um, provide for a motion to rescind, and um, if all council members are present, which um, at least in this case they are, uh, then a majority vote of council would be what would be needed to rescind. Uh, and place it back on the table. This was a vote to rezone. The vote was what to rezone. That was it was a motion, right, to rezone the property, and that failed. Mm -hmm. That failed to be approved. I have a question on top of that. Would it have to have been, I mean, a naysay voter? Does it have to be sp no. specific? No, that, you're thinking of a motion for reconsideration? Yeah. Uh, and that is a whole different okay. piece than so that. Yeah, the we're the we're into a motion to rescind, which does not require that. Does that prejudice a previous action? Uh, it would not, particularly if, if a new public hearing, and my recommendation was yeah. if we were inclined to, to do this, that a new public hearing be done and that anybody that wanted to speak, we, we go through the whole process um, so that, you know, there there is there is sufficient um, evidence. You can totally as go through a six I, I honestly, I think that's... That is the remedy here. <laughs> that is the remedy. Is to, is to allow council now to, you know, again, hear, hear all the parameters. Apparently there's been some discussion about changes in traffic pattern or something on the site, so I think a public hearing would be. Um, I was not on council at the time. The vote was taken. However, I did watch the meeting on TV. And um, Mr. Frazier, you indicated that it's just dumb not to consider uh, the Golden Corral. And I, I think he can think to that. I said, that no, it's dumb not to dumb consider not to con reven revenue. Revenue. Dumb New revenue, consider. yes. New revenue, yes, you did say that. But I guess my issue is sitting at this table, you have to take a look at each, each item that's before us. Um, and just because it may bring revenue, I think we've got, in my, I should just speak for me, I have to look at the full impact of that revenue coming to the city, what type of people it, if it's, it's going to draw. 
if it's the right location. And I'm just not, at this point, would I be interested in entertaining bringing it back again? I would not vote um, in favor of it. I just don't think the rolling ground is great for that uh, that part of the city. I know Lakewood Village would then benefit from the taxes if they're looking at that. But I just don't think, uh, for me, I would be interested in reconsidering it and having it come back. Okay, since the remarks were meant directly, were made directly to me. I'm only saying, and I agree with you, I wouldn't, I don't think that carte blanche, we uh, agree to anything that brings money in, but I do, I strongly believe that we ought to at least give uh, uh, decent and a, a genuine hearing to anyone that wants to do business in the city of Southfield, and then we take a vote on whether it's something that we want to do or not. That's, but I mean, the vote was already taken with the previous council. I mean, <coughs> almost undo everything else that was already put in place. I, I, I'm not going to, I can't see you changing it. But I understand that. Mr. Perkinson, let me uh, say this. <coughs> uh, the, um, the pieces that the city has available for redevelopment or development of problem pieces. And so I asked <coughs> a planning director to look, at, to look at 12 mile road to 15 mile road. Um, since the boulevard has been postponed to who knows when, <coughs> that we look at this very delaying packet is just that the, the, the my road is getting all messed up. It, it, it does not look like uh, like it's planned. It looks like whatever comes, comes. And what we really got me to think this way, and why I approached Terry, is we cleared the office building off next to Cracker Barrel uh, for McDonald's. <laughs> and and if you look at that lot today, and you look behind it, you know, you know of a terrific impact that we had and changed the entire environment of a wonderful, nice, multiple facilities. And and if those people in Delphi are going to look over the back of the McDonald's room. And, and, and that, to me, even though I, I voted against the McDonald's, but it has kind of reassured me that we really, you know, if we're trying to get people to live here, we, we can't put adverse things in front of them. And to me, between Cracker Barrel and not to mention business, but and, and the McDonald's sitting there in front of this nice development that just that's the only way you can get in is between Cracker Barrel and it was going to be McDonald's, but you look at that today and it's clear. It, it tells you that we've got to study these pieces more carefully. And and not only that, but you know, we look at my roads and we look about landscaping. If they're not gonna do a boulevard, then we should look at a landscaping plan for Southfield Road from Lathrop to our city limits. They dressed it up somehow. There's <coughs> some kind of continuity between all these zonings. I mean, we've got Burger King, and then we got Office, and then we got we got Target, and then we got this, and then we got that, and and I mean, then you got a, a a bank that's closed, and then you got a shopping center, and I mean, then you got condos, the real nice <coughs> dwellings, and and to me, then we go ahead with the trailer park, we say, oh, we're going to clean up Southfield Road, and and we. Make everybody put brick and nice walls and protect it from the commercial. And and to me, it looks like somebody didn't know what they're doing. And and now, since this has come up, now you have a lot of rumors coming out that Walmart is going to come in with a petition for St. Pete's piece. So, so what kind of impact <coughs> is that going to have? I mean, you know, you got a major 12 mile road, Southfield intersection there, the high traffic, large accident corner, and you've got 13 miles in, in Southfield, that's also a high accident uh, intersection, and everything between it is hush -bush. And And so I personally <coughs> am not in any way ready to move on anything that would have any kind of impact on that mile at uh, this time, unless I know what it's going to be planned to clean up that whole dog. We had an office building there. 
it caught on fire. It was it was not adverse to the neighborhood. Uh, and now we're going to do something that will be different as far as impact, regardless of what it is. And and I and I just am personally am not ready to to move on it. And that's my strong feeling. And I think we got away from planning by area. We just put whatever you want. Yes. There are 31 small restaurants <coughs> on South Hill Road, right off South Hill Road, going close 13 mile and below. You talk about revenue. You're going to eliminate 31 small businesses. I'm not ready to do that. And you're going to eliminate close to 200 jobs. That's what's going to happen. You may not believe it. That's what's going to happen, and that's what Golden Crowd is going to do. Just by the size and what they sell. And there are lots of, lots of reasons. And I'm not ready to destroy all the small business around here. Not ready. Not now. So, you know my feelings. I'd rather have the small business here for them to grow than hire more people, which they will. But if the other thing happens, uh -uh. we're going to have empty stores. We'll be a ghost town. And that besides the traffic and the, and the police security, oh, many, many reasons. We don't have enough police officers right now to protect us. What's going to happen when the 12,000 square foot restaurants are going to be put there? And how many people are going to come in there in the traffic? What happened to Red Lobster? What happened to State Mail? What's happening now to Nicola's also? And what's happening to all the restaurants that we had? They're gone. Nicola's is there. I can't ever find a parking place until I go there. Right, right. But he's having trouble. He's having trouble. People are coming in to him, eating. They finish their meal. Then they get up and scream. The food is so good. They refuse to pay. They refuse to tip. That's what's happening. The poor guy is at wit's end. What could he do? Nothing. He calls the police. Can't find the place there when they when they're called because it's a minor <coughs> infraction. People don't want to pay the bill. But anyway, that's beside the point. I don't want to see 31 small businesses go out of business and lose all the revenue that we're making from the close to 200 employees that they have. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it looks like this is going in one direction. So I'll be really short and brief, but, you know, I did, I watched the September meeting. Um, my question was actually on the process earlier, not necessarily what was discussed at that meeting, but, uh, it, you know, you, I watched it for hours as, as, as there was litany of complaints and complaints and complaints against the project, and, and it just sounds like they've made a good faith effort. I didn't know that um, Mr. Frazier was going to recognize them. There's a good faith effort to address some serious issues that was with the project, and if they're wanting to come back and present that, I'd like, I, you know, I want to give them that fair shake. You know, if, there's, if we reach a point where, you know, they can't make any more concessions on their end, they can't modify their plans, then it's the puzzle pieces don't fit together. But they're right now chiseling those puzzle pieces to fit from what was discussed at that meeting. So, I mean, if, if, if you come into this and still aren't pleased, then by all means, you know, don't support it. But they, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's the exact same plan. They wouldn't. They wouldn't want to go through another meeting like that. You know, where they where they're coming through it, and we're just beating them down uh, for another couple hours. Um, they make. Are, seems like they're making a good faith effort to work with the city to take notes from what happened, to work with the residents, um, and just want to represent the plan. So I think they're worth. It's worth the fair hearing at least, uh, even if you want to vote no, um, because you have your own prerogative, which it's perfectly fine. 
Did you hear what I said? But Don't you believe what I said? I, I heard you, Mr. Lance. I, I'm just saying that they who, have, they who, have who, amended... Who convinced you and who called you to bring it up tonight? I didn't bring it up. I didn't call them up. Right, though. Who called... I don't want to get into that. All right. Okay. I don't want it for the reasons I gave. I understand. I can give you ten more reasons why it'll hurt the city. But I'll stop here. Okay. Well, I'm going to add something that I remember from that meeting, uh, because the big boys, there were a lot of restaurants that came in, and there was a lot of restaurants, plus a lot of their employees from all over the state of Michigan that told us how wonderful it would be for us. But the thing that I remember, the big boy uh, restaurant people told us that Golden Corral people came in with employment applications for the big boy employees and told them to fill that out because when they came in, they were going to put their boy out of business. So they made their position rather clear. I personally am not, um, I just don't think it's right for that area. There's, I think there's land on Eight Mile Road that would be maybe they want to look at. I, I can't support it for that area. I just can't take that right up front. It, it appears the council has made their decision, but I just want to put a couple of things on the table. Um, we don't have a long line of restaurants knocking on our door. We have tried to recruit them. Um, we cannot manage competition. I understand what you're saying, Mr. Lance, but we get not competing competition. We we get competing businesses all the time, and we approve them. Because city. It has nothing to do with competition. Yeah, I know. But we have we have vacant land, um, and we do have a chance to get some revenue. And I, it, it concerns me that um, we use the data that was presented <coughs> and the voice of the the, the resident to, I think, to deny them because this council does not deny development based on liking a product. That's not our role. It is to make sure the zoning is correct, they meet the rules, and if they can acquire the property, that's the role of the council. But when we get into our personal likes and dislikes, that's a whole other area or lane we shouldn't be in. Um, but it is, it is an opportunity. I heard the residents, and they had some concerns. And if, and if the petitioner has the ability to address those concerns and those same residents and those same residents are satisfied and then this development could be built, it seems like that would be a win-win for the community, but we won't ever have that chance. And, you know, it's interesting. I remember sitting through that 7-Eleven debate that we had that was on 11 Mile and Easter Road, and we were up all night. They had residents from Farmington Hills, and everybody was telling us how that was going to destroy their neighborhood. It was a quiet neighborhood. And we have not had one ounce of problems from that. So the same residents go to that The yes. same residents used that facility. Well, the and then they went through it. They had holdups there. Okay. So don't use that as an example. But the same, the but the same resident at another time told me that they did not realize how convenient it was for that community. And so it is, um, it is, a, there is always that excitement. And so it's, one of the things that we're going to deal with in this city, and we're hearing it, is that we're going to have to demolish buildings throughout this city because of their becoming their they're older, they have asbestos, and in the prime days, when you de demolished a building, and it was vacant land, someone immediately came in and wanted to build on it. We can continue to have vacant lots throughout the city, or we're going to have to start looking at being um, committed to bringing development here. And my biggest concern about, no, I don't like it, is that the word gets out. And this is going to become the community of no, and that you have—it's so hard to do business in the city of Southfield. I think we should have our standards, 
but to just deny the opportunity to look at a new plan. You may still want to say no, which is the council's prerogative, and I respect that and I understand that. But to deny the opportunity, because what if, what if this is presented and the residents say, we're okay with it now, and you can go ahead and build it, then what would be our reason other than we don't want a Golden Corral? And is that the role of council? is to dictate the actual store or the restaurant that is coming. We don't like what you're going to serve, so we're going to deny your use. So I, I just, I don't eat at Golden Corral, and I still haven't gone to one, but I can tell you I was bombarded with people. They just love it, and it's a diverse use of restaurants who don't have other restaurants knocking on our door. And it's a way of bringing people into this community People come to your community, they, they like it, and they want to live in it. They want to, if they're there, wait, maybe they'll go over to the shopping mall that's right next door and spend money. Sometimes when people don't, they have to wait, they'll go to the big boy. I've done that. I've gone to restaurants I wanted to go to. The line was too long, so I went to the neighboring restaurant. They're going to bring more traffic into that area for big boy which is a restaurant I know the owner very well and I want her to be successful. She's, she's an excellent community um, addition to our community. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I also talk to people. And I talk and I know for sure that I speak to more people than you do. When I go to Sam's, when I go out there, People stop me and talk to me. Dozens and dozens and dozens. And I ask them about the type of restaurant there and the little restaurants, and they agree with me. So you're you're putting fear into people by your speech. We're we're not supposed to be talking directly to each other. What? We're not supposed to be talking directly to each other. We're supposed to be talking to the public. We should we should talk directly. No, we can't. We're not. We can't. I'm talking. I'm talking to the heaven. <laughs> well, you just heard what I said. I'm talking. I'm talking to the visitors here. I'm talking to myself. But I talk to a lot of people out there. A lot of constituents. <coughs> Three, four calls a day to people with trouble, and I solve their problem. And look, well, <coughs> I'm I'm not for it. And tonight I'm gonna, and I'm telling you, I'm not for it. I think both people are going to not favor paying this tax. I don't know if they. Uh, 
a couple of things. We're going to be asking for a Rule 10, and the reason for it is the best reason I can think of, and that is that this is life saving equipment, and if we can get it up uh, within our possession uh, even, even a day earlier, uh, we recommend it. And uh, with that, um, if you have any questions, uh, the expertise uh, is here. Uh, thank you, Hugh Rowley, to introduce. Uh, good evening. Heroes that you have here. Good with you. Uh, Madam President, uh, Council, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, Mr. Charette, and uh, residents. Uh, my name is Keith Rowley. For, mo for uh, most of you, uh, most of you know me, but uh, I'm one of the acting chiefs here in the fire department. Uh, and to my right is uh, firefighter paramedic Ken Wheaton, and to his right is uh, Captain Tom Colombo. Uh, Captain Colombo is our EMS coordinator. Uh, he runs the paramedic program. And uh, if I could, uh, publicly, I'd like to uh, uh, talk a little bit about Ken Wheaton just for a minute. I won't take very long. Uh, Ken uh, has been instrumental uh, in uh, grant writing for us here in the department. Uh, he's been uh, successfully uh, writing uh, grants uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, he has uh, brought in uh, $2,239,498 presently into the community. Uh, and uh, he, much of the work that he does, he does on his own time. Uh, very little of it is done uh, uh, while he's on, on the job just because we're so busy he doesn't have time to do it. Uh, he spends countless hours at home, uh, two new babies, and uh, he's just one of your dedicated firefighters that, uh, that knows the value in, in writing these grants and bringing money into the community. So they are the expertise. Uh, if you have questions on the grant uh, itself, uh, Ken will be able to answer that for you also on the equipment and Captain Colombo will be able to answer uh, any questions on the equipment also. There was one element that uh, is deferred, if you could give some detail on that, it's the uh, compression systems. Yeah, it's uh, back um, later. We, we put in uh, for uh, three different items, uh, EKG monitor defibrillators uh, to replace equipment that we already have that's uh, quite old now, I think, I believe it's 12 years old and uh, outdated, uh, and technology advances so quickly in this area. Uh, I'll let uh, Ken and Tom talk about the advances in the technology. And then uh, uh, our automatic external defibrillators um, uh, are uh, a little defibrillator that uh, uh, the community is taught how to use. Uh, actually, we had uh, life-saving here uh, in the city, in the clerk's office. We had uh, one of our employees, one of the employees go down, uh, was in cardiac arrest. Uh, these automatic external defibrillators were applied to her, and uh, she's with us today because of those defibrillators. So uh, they're very valuable. Uh, these defibrillators will be put on our engines. If our engine is out in the community and uh, uh, a call comes in and they beat the uh, life truck there, uh, they, they have uh, these uh, AEDs, they're called, and they can apply those to the patient quickly. Uh, the third item was uh, chest compression devices. These uh, are devices, when you're doing CPR, it's very labor intensive. Uh, technology has advanced, so they've, they've actually developed a machine now, and I'll let Ken talk a little more about this. They can actually do the compressions. It's, it, it's a much safer way to do compressions. It's more efficient, and you don't have to have a, an in, a, a paramedic standing up while an ambulance is going down the street, uh, leaning over the patient, unbuckled, uh, which is very dangerous. Uh, I don't know how many times I have my head thrown into the, uh, the uh, shelves on the other side when that ambulance turned because you're not strapped in. Uh, so this, this device would, would take the place of one man. Uh, what's happened is there's some literature that's come out to FEMA that disputes its efficiency, so FEMA's put that uh, uh, item on hold until uh, further uh, uh, research is done on it. So that was one of our items that uh, we may get in the future, but that money is, those monies are on hold right now. But if you have any questions on the on the grant itself, or, or further questions on the technical end, because Ken is very uh, educated on the on the technical end of, of both the uh, the uh, new technology in our EKG monitors and on the AEDs. So I'll turn I'll turn the mic over to these two gentlemen, and they can give you a little bit of update on that. Hi. <laughs> I guess I'll just take any questions that you have about the equipment. Um, I'm really excited to have this equipment. I've got. Um, a little over 12 years on the job now, and I remember getting the Life Pack 15 or 12 that we currently have, as well as the AED shortly after I hired on, and they definitely exceeded their lifespan. <coughs> the average lifespan for the equipment that we're replacing successfully with this grant is eight to 10 years, 
we're at 12, working on 13 years right now. So um, it's got a lot of really good technology that's going to enhance our capabilities of successfully resuscitating patients. And I've been a uh, proud uh, member of the teams here, um, rescue crew, the engine crews, and have been part of successful resuscitations. And that is what my goal is whenever I'm taking care of a patient is to see them discharged from the hospital five, six, seven, ten, twelve 10, 12 days later, whatever it is, neurologically intact. And there's nothing um, that gives me more joy than that. This equipment is going to enhance our capability to do that. So I guess I'll just take any questions, like any specifics that you have about the equipment. Mr. Um, can I, or Keith, I wondered, um, and maybe you've already uh, answered this, but um, these are still functioning um, defibrillators. Uh, I was wondering if they could be used someplace else. Uh, if they still have life, and they do. Um, you know, I guess according to the, as far as for their value, they are considered fully depreciated. How, however, they still have a lot of value to us. That we could put them on our engines is something we wanted to do for a long time. As you know, our engines go on medical runs, and we need that because yeah. just today, if you ever listen to the radios, about once a day, all four life units are out of service. So we rely on the engines to do a lot of backup, or you actually be in first responders on the scene until one of the life units gets cleared, or we have to get private ambulance in here. So what we'd like to do is take the old monitors and put them on the engines. Because on the engines, on any given day, I usually have at least one paramedic, and oftentimes I still have two paramedics on the engine, so they could use those as a stopgap until the life unit gets there. That would be what we're hoping to do. Good. Thank you. Mr. Frazier. Uh, <coughs> I uh, read this information, and, um, and as unusual as this may sound, I find that the media need to act <laughs> <laughs> on this. Uh, Second. I found in the media need to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No. <laughs> well, after after the motion's on the floor, then yeah. yeah. what we should be talking about. Yeah. We have a motion by Mr. Frazier, mm -hmm. supported by Mr. Cyber, to do we have immediate need to act, so we're invoking rule 10. Thank you. Do we have to go to roll call? No. 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 All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Madam, Madam Chair, I support the recommendation that was presented to uh, uh, purchase the new equipment for the fire department for the EMS uh, and upgrade the equipment. Support. Motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Mr. Steiner, to support uh, and authorize the uh, approval of a uh, purchase of the equipment. All in favor? All right. All right. All right. That's 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 I mean, did you hear? I just say, did you vote? Yeah, 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 we did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The comment I have is in, in the experience that we had with Peggy over there in the clerk's office. <coughs> no one knew where the, the panels were. And they were sitting right behind the, the information desk. Somehow, we've got to have those put somewhere where either there's some light there or something put where there's some kind of electronics so people can actually see. Uh, where they're at in case of emergency. Uh, number two is what? We, we knew where they were. We knew where no, they, they went over the parks and rec and no, got that one. That's not true. Well, we, that's we what know, I heard. Okay. No, well, we knew where they were. We didn't know how to use them. Okay. Well, we didn't know how to use them. Okay. okay. I heard we several stories. Yeah. So yeah. the next point I'm trying to make is I understand you got a three hour program, and but a one hour program, I think we should start educating us and, and anybody that's in this building working. You know, uh, either have two half-hour sessions at lunchtime or an hour session after lunchtime to get segments of this building to get trained on how to use it so they're not timid with it. Mm -hmm. They know how to grab it. They know what to do with it. And and, uh, and we were very fortunate in that case that other people knew how to use it. 
But if it was up to employees of ours, that lady would not be here today. Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Percassi, um, I'll work with uh, Captain Colombo and we'll, we'll put together some shorter, more frequent programs, uh, repetition with those type of, types and, of And programs. this should be mandatory, by the way, I believe. Everybody should be able to save one another's life. If they have, if they have an opportunity. What? I just have to need a motion. Keith said that he would take care of it, I believe he's taking care of it. It ought to be part of our first aid class.
trying to see, you know, where we are with these court cases and what what the the, the uh, clearest and most um, efficient way of dealing with medical marijuana is. And hopefully within that time, maybe we'll get some pronouncement from the Michigan Supreme Court, and that would be wonderful in guiding us. So. Move the rule 10. Support. Motion on Mr. Stiver, supported by Ms. Jordan, to invoke the rule 10. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. I um, okay. move uh, the proposed extension on the medical marijuana facility moratorium for another 180 mm -hmm. days. Motion by Mr. Cyber, so I'd like to join to extend the um, moratorium for another 180 days. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion has carried. Other items? Yeah, I, um, one old item and uh, regarding a letter we received um, as well as the letter that's in our uh, uh, packet this week. Um, I did respond to the person who uh, wrote about, I'll get there, uh, who wrote about the um, a missing jigsaw puzzle at McDonald Towers. Um, some of us got that letter from Mar mm -hmm. Lynn the letter. Clown. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, no one knows what happened. Uh, the lights have been repaired and water has been put down the drains to stop the gas. And they can do jigsaw puzzles in the library in case anybody wants to know. Um, then uh, we received another letter, uh, and I know sometimes the city administration doesn't get these letter, so um, it's from Mrs. Bates in Green Dolphin next to um, the uh, charter school uh, with a lengthy list of, of um, disturbing the peace complaints. And um, I'm just bringing it up only to make sure that it doesn't get lost. I don't know if uh, Jim I, I am aware. I am aware of the letter. I'd like to report to council that we uh, will have a task force to address it. Uh, busy with uh, 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 preparing the, the uh, preview of the budget. I'm aware of it, and uh, we will aggressively address it. Um, it's there, there's been problems there before, and uh, we need to we need to pay. Uh, progress before and now there are new, new persons in charge and uh, we will pay them a visit before that. I wanted to comment on that item also. I was going to bring it up. Uh, you know, we had the, uh, the <coughs> vulnerable dwellings and condos next to the palace and we really went to the wall uh, to, to uh, stop any infections there, involved noises, cars and everything else. Uh, <coughs> I can see where they really have a situation there because of the uh, learning, uh, letting it out to a facility that isn't at a school. I think it's a religious group. But they have, you know, different kinds of programs with youth and all this. And and they come out right on the side of the residence. And the driveway is right on the residence side. The property line. Yeah. And so... So um, either they're going to have to adhere to, to uh, I guess, respect the neighbors, or somehow we're going to have to restrict the use of those buildings because, I mean, I, it has been a, an issue that's come up many times. We've sat with the people in that neighborhood. We sat with the administrator of the school. <coughs> he gave us his home address, and they, I don't even think he's here anymore. No. But... But uh, this thing is just way out of hand, and, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing when you can't, uh, you know, can't use your own home and you can't go to sleep at night for the rest, and, 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 you're, and you can't sell your home because you're underwater, you know, and so you're at the mercy of whatever you're living with the environment. And, and as far as I'm concerned, we're gonna, they have to be closed up if they keep making noise. I mean, they need to be. Made cognizant of 
the annoyance they are to the neighbors. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Through the Chair, to the City Administrator, because that is my neighborhood, uh, if it's all right with the rest of the Council, I would like to be involved in whatever task force, because I do get visited by uh, some of the neighbors. <laughs> Great, love to have you. Okay. Myron, you were elected. I guess. Yeah, I was elected before I got here tonight. <laughs> uh, to be part of it. And Jim, before you know, uh, when you when you get somebody doing the homework, I'd like to know how many times they call the police department and what they respond to. I think I don't think we're going to do more of the same this time. Yeah. We need some. We need a new approach. And we're going to. We're going we're going to do <coughs> what, what we're doing uh, uh, in, uh, in Mr. Lance's uh, apartments where he, where he lives. We have a task force, okay, because there's a complaint letter that came out of the list, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, when we get done with, with the approach there, things will improve. We, we've identified the causes of the problem. <coughs> with the principal of that, of that Rick Hot Bradford Academy and uh, I think he'll be very responsive to uh, whatever we come up with to see if he can be a good neighbor. Good.
person. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, or internships, you know, or have an intern go down there and work a couple hours. Got a volunteer right here. What's this? Yeah, yeah, we'll take a look. I think I'm not totally pleased with the
you know, I did Nick. Uh, I had somebody, graphics person, who had designed the bat. It really, I don't know what he ever did with it, uh, but it was an idea, you know, with the flags and everything when you come in and, and pieces of artwork in the middle lit up. And you can do wonders with very little money and donations. And like I said, Silverman would be glad to, to get a piece of art from his building. Um, uh, I got a letter from somebody that, from way back when uh, Joe Elias, uh, John Elias died. Uh, it was just Roy Rogers was over there to go and drive. They planted a tree out in front of the boulevard. And I looked over there trying to figure out what kind of tree because they cut most of them down already. You know, <laughs> you know. But we used to get. What I said is, we used to get businesses to put plants out there, to put trees out there. You know, and you know, in the name of somebody, uh, whatever. I mean, we've got to get kind of thinking out of the box. When you're short of money, that doesn't mean you got to stop thinking. Okay. That's it. I, I just want to say I agree. I, every time uh, you travel to another city and you see their their uh, business areas, there's always that art fashion. You know, some of them went through the thing where they had the cows on every corner and then they they did all that. But it just it just speaks to the to the appreciation <coughs> and the appreciation of art when you have that outdoor art. And normally you get a partnership with an artist and you get, you know, them to erect something and it's usually sponsored, but I think it speaks so much to a community when you see that outdoor art. And our interest is our, I mean, that's a powerful interest telegraph. And I think if we did something, you know, I, I totally agree with you. It says a lot about our community. Yeah, Seattle over there, they, you know, they would probably get one, we would get one, Silverman would get one. Popeye before they get to the next one. Yeah, Popeye. Yeah. 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 The last time I met with the executive board, they were pointing to the dead trees on that boulevard and how mm -hmm. they were very annoyed about that. Mm -hmm. He said, we put all this money in our landscaping and watch <coughs> the boulevard on the uh, telegraph oh, the you. dead yeah. trees. And, and here's a multi-million dollar company and they're concerned about dead I trees. I drive down telegraph north, north of us and they got that marble entrance, whatever it is, to go through a hill. Mm -hmm. I see red <coughs> landscaping trucks in that right away, you know, planting and cutting and everything and and this thing's three years and they haven't put my sprinklers back on them. And I mean they didn't take out the old bushes. They took out the nice stuff. Not the ugly bushes over there that overgrown. There's weeds coming up out of them. I mean I mean it's it's unbelievable. I mean it's embarrassing. You know, I, it's uh we <laughs> keep Everybody does this to us, and, and you know, and I get tired of that. I mean, can this guy come up there in Lansing, come down here and look at what, he, what the place looks like? Or, or maybe, maybe if we let, um, uh, what's the place up here tonight? Um, the restaurant. Oh, the ground. Oh, the ground. That's the smart. <laughs> <laughs>